Hey everybody, what's going on? Hexlex here, got another Master Duel video for you. So today we're going to be covering a deck profile for a deck that I haven't covered in a long, long, long time. And that is going to be Tri Brigade Lyralusk, aka okay, good old bird up. Uh, I've covered this deck quite a bit in the earlier seasons of Master Duel, way back in seasons like 1, 2, 3, and a little bit of 4 I think as well. But after that, this deck definitely kind of took a back seat for me personally. But it's definitely one of those decks um, in the similar vein of like Ad Emancipator, and honestly, in my opinion, Drytron as well. Um, that you know was more popular in early Master Duel, but then you know shiny new decks came out. But like this deck still isn't bad by any means, uh, if you know piloted with proper representation and piloted well enough. Uh, this is one of like many, 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 many decks that like definitely pushes the boundary between Rogue and Tier 3. Um, I think if people, for some reason, like, in mass started playing Bird Up again, we would definitely see Tier 3 representation for the deck. But, um, you know, as is, it's fine. Um, in fact, it's even... It, in some ways, it even works to the advantage of decks like this, because some people might not be as familiar when they see uh, you start playing Lyrlusk monsters and might not know how to counter your combos. So as far as this deck's combos, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, because like I said, it has been quite a while since we covered the deck here. The main combo that the deck likes to go into and end on is uh, making a couple of recital starlings, which uh, can search more level 1 winged beasts through your deck, so that helps. Uh, and then using those two recital starlings on turn 1 to go into uh, F0 Utopic Future, and then from there Utopic Draco Future. Uh, this being a very good boss monster to end on. Uh, can't be destroyed, and not only negates effects, but if that monster was on the field that it negates, you actually get to steal it and take control of it. Uh, but that's not the only thing you end on. Uh, a pretty standard turn one uh, bird up end board will also end on a Simorg, which during the end phase will allow you to special summon an Apex Avion from your deck. And then you also typically end on an Ensemble Robin. Uh, this is a Lyralesque monster that the main thing you're looking for here is this first effect, or rather, second effect, I guess. Uh, if your opponent special summons a monster uh, during the, or except during the damage step, you can detach one material and target one of those special summoned monsters, return it to the hand. And that's not once per turn. So uh, you'll get Ensemble Robin with like three or four materials on it. So that represents three to four uh, disruptions right there in one card. And also, um, that's bouncing too. That's not even just like destroying or banishing. Uh, which those can trigger certain effects, but bouncing, uh, that's going to trigger much less effects. And also, uh, you can summon this and the Apex Avion uh, underneath the Simorg here, and that's going to prevent those cards from being targeted, which is going to be very, very nice. It means they can't get impermed or uh, hit with a lot of different kinds of removal there. One of the other big strengths that Bird Up in particular has in this format is its ability to not only play, but also search DD Crow. DD Crow is... I was going to say it's a, a great, it's a, it's an alright tech card right now. Um, I gotta be real, I don't think DD Crow is like super duper good in this format. Now, it's easy to think like, but Lex, you know, Math Mech is playing super factorial, um, and just Math Mech in general with Diameter and Sigma, how could DD Crow not be good right now? The thing about DD Crow um, against Math Mech and against most decks in general is, as you can see, I'm typing in Sergi up here, uh, Ghost Spell. Ghost Spell is going to pretty much cover just about everything dd crow can um and also then some now to be fair one thing dd crow can do that ghost spell can't is uh banish and also call by as well uh dd crow can banish spell and trap cards out of the graveyard that actually matters sometimes especially with sky striker being as prevalent as they are but if you're looking again to specifically stop like math mech super factorial and that kind of a thing generally speaking Ghost Spell is the way to go. So why are we playing DD Crow in this deck then over Ghost Spell if that's the opinion I have? Well, DD Crow is a level 1 winged beast, which means it is searchable by uh, Leerless Recital Starling as well as um, the Leerless Cobalt Sparrow. So it's actually not uncommon at all to have an extra search for a level 1 winged beast in your combo. And if you do have that extra search, you just go ahead and grab a disruption for free. So when it's being searched for free, off of stuff you're already playing, then yes, I think DD Crow is 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 a fine tech choice for this format. But again, if you're playing like other decks, then I generally recommend Ghost Spell if you have access to it. But 
Diddy Crow is still not a terrible card, but Ghost Spell in most situations just tends to be a little bit better. The rest of the build is fairly self-explanatory. We're playing two Cobalt Sparrow because this card is a two. Why is this card still a two, by the way? Like, why is this card still a two? Fractal? I mean, I personally want Fractal to be a three, but at the very least, because Tri Brigade is used with, like, sprites and so many other archetypes, I can see why Fractal might want to be at two. But Cobalt Sparrow, this card can really be at three. I feel like you played two even when this card was at three. It's like, um... That virtual world monster, Roshi Lao Lao, that they hit, I think was the one to two. Like, we, it's like, all right, I, I only played two of it anyway, but okay. I felt that way about Sparrow as well. I have no idea why this card is still at two, but. Um, yeah, otherwise we play three of, of the Turquoise Warbler and the Barrel Canary. Uh, the Warbler is a good three of because it's your main starter, the one you like to open with most. And then uh, Barrel Canary can be a good catch up card, a good comeback card. Uh, so we like top decking into it. The Sapphire Swallowtail and Celestine Wagtail, um, those are more like extenders, so that's why we're playing two of each. Wagtail, you could honestly only play one, and that would be fine. Um, I'm mostly just playing two to make it a little bit more consistent, because opening with multiple level one birds is, is pretty nice, and being able to special summon this and grab the bird call from your deck is also very nice. We're playing Tenkies, those are just to get Fractals. One thing to note about Fractal in this deck is, you know, most of the time when you're playing Fractal, you're of course sending the Kit and then the Norval to add something. Uh, in this build, it's usually gonna be Chaos that you add, but Fractal can send any level through or lower Winged Beast to the graveyard. Uh, so that's actually relevant sometimes for sending the Cobalt Sparrow to the graveyard. Uh, sometimes you can start your plays by using Fractal to Foolish this and then uh, use the or is it the, the Turquoise Warbler to bring the Sparrow back from the graveyard? Um, because the, the Turquoise Warbler can special summon a Leerless from the hand or graveyard, so... Speaking of Foolish, I actually should have a copy of this. I'm only just now realizing that I don't. So that is one card I could actually cut the second Wagtail for as a Foolish Burial. Could also cut one of the Imperms. Would actually be a pretty good idea, because I gotta be real. I don't remember if I've mentioned this yet in a video yet or not, but... Imperm and Valor, I'm not really feeling them a whole lot this format, I'm not gonna lie. I, I just don't think they're that great right now. Um, they're good against Sword Soul, but Sword Soul in general feels a little bit mid right now. Um, and on top of that, like, they don't really do effective jobs stopping the other big meta decks of Mathmech or Branded Despia. Those two decks can very often play through an Imperm or a Valor. So I'm really not super feeling it right now. That might change once Sprite's about to come out and that's gonna shake up the meta hugely. So, you know, take that evaluation with a grain of salt. But in exactly the the post-circular pre-Sprite meta, Imperm Valor, I don't think they're super great. All right, I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about the build here. Um, yeah, that's pretty much everything. Oh, one thing I will say, that you can do with this deck that I always forget to do, but is actually pretty nice, is Assembled Nightingale. So if your combo gets disrupted and you're afraid of getting OTK'd, one thing you can do is you can end on an Assembled Nightingale and then pass to your opponent. Because Nightingale has a quick effect, you can detach your material and then your Lilith monsters can't be destroyed. But more importantly, you take no battle damage and that's for the whole turn. Uh, that's for the whole turn you activate this effect and the Nightingale does not have to remain in play. So. Um, yeah, that's a very good, very, very good tool to use if your combo gets disrupted and or you think your opponent's just about to OTK you on their next turn. Just go for a Nightingale and then detach the material during their turn and then no battle damage. So you will survive through that turn unless they're on like burn or whatever, but, um, or runic, I guess, <laughs> to be fair, but, um, yeah. Okay. So I think that's about everything I wanted to talk about now. So now let's go ahead and break this build down card by card, and then take a look at some games. So, we're playing one DD Crow, two Leerlisk Cobalt Sparrow, two Leerlisk Sapphire Swallow, three Leerlisk Turquoise Warbler, three Tri Brigade Nerval, three Leerlisk Barrel Canary, two Leerlisk Celestine Wagtail, three Max C, one Tri Brigade Chaos, one Tri Brigade Kit, three Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring, two Tri Brigade Fractal, one Mist Valley Apex Avian, one Nibiru, the Primal Being, one one four one. It's really trippy to say. Uh, three Leerlisk Bird Call, two Fire Formation Tenki, 
two called by the grave, one cross out designator, and then three infinite impermanence. That's going to round out the main deck. For the extra deck, we're playing one number F0, Utopic Future, two Leerlisk, Recital Starling, one Leerlisk, Assembled Nightingale, one number F0, Utopic Draco Future, one Leerlisk, Ensemble Robin, one Downard Magician, one Divine Arsenal, Ah, Zeus, Sky Thunder, one Salaman Great Almirage, one Ancient Warrior's Oath, Double Dragon Lords, one Tri Brigade Farajit, the Baron Blossom, one Race Vulgar, the Desperate Doom Eagle, one Simorg, the Bird of Sovereignty, one Access Code Talker, and then finally, one Tri Brigade Shurig, the Ominous Omen. That's going to round out the extra. Now let's go and take a look at those games. Alright, so our first duel here is going to be up against Sword Soul Tenyi. Which, like I said kind of earlier in this, this profile, I kind of glossed over that statement, but I do think Sword Soul's a little bit mid right now. It just, it doesn't feel like it does enough against Math Mech in particular. Alright, so we're going first, and this opening hand is looking fairly decent. I mean, it's looking pretty good. Uh, we have the Warbler plus uh, a relevant Target 2 Special Summon in the form of Wagtail, so can't complain too much. Um, a lot of this extra stuff, like the... The Apex Saving and the Barrel Canary is not ideal to open with because we can just search it out later, but uh, Barrel Canary is also not bad to open with because, like I said, when we open some of our combo pieces, that means we get to use our later searches for, like, DD Crow and stuff like that. So, I'm going to start with the Warbler into the Wagtail. It's going to let me add the Bird Call from deck to hand. Uh, I'm going to fire off the Bird Call here just to add the Sparrow now. Uh, I did that mostly before overlaying just to check and see if my opponent had an Ash Blossom because... Um, I want to add, like, a Nerval off of this Recital Starling here. Um, and I want to make sure that this doesn't get negated. So I, f I figured maybe if I threw out the Bird Call, my opponent might Ash that. I guess I'm not adding Nerval just yet. We'll add that off of the second Starling. I'll add the Sapphire Swallow. Is he actually the one you want to add next? Because we two special summon this uh, Cobalt Sparrow from our, from our hand. Yeah, here I grabbed Barrel Canary by accident. I should have grabbed DD Crow, but... I was kind of on like autopilot mode <laughs> when I was playing this game, so I was like, okay, now I grab Barrel Canary, and then I looked, oops, I already have one in hand, but it's not that big of a deal, honestly. We missed out on DD Crow, but it's, it's kind of whatever. So yeah, now I'm going to add Nerval with the second Recital Starling. From there, we can overlay our two Recital Starlings, like I mentioned, into F-Zero Utopic Future, and then F-Zero Utopic Draco Future. I do recommend going for this card uh, sooner in the combo, when possible, rather than later. Um, because it can add some nice insulation against some potential hand traps. Now, to be fair, if my opponent had, like, Nibiru or something, they probably would have already dropped it, but um, it's a relatively non-committal uh, way to just kind of, like, go into your place, because we haven't even used our normal summon yet, and on top of that, we still have this Burial Canary in hand that we can make use of as well, so. So to give our normal summon, I'm just going to run out Nerval as my normal summon here, and run out the Ferajit. Can you use Ferajit to summon Kit? This is going to let me end on an Ancient Warrior's Oath Double Dragon Lords, which the deck doesn't always end on, but um, on turn one anyway. But because of the way we open, we actually can. So from there, I'm going to link into the Simorg. As you can see, it's any two monsters, including a Winged Beast. So Ferajit plus Nerval will do that nicely. Plus, now I can use, well, now I can not only add off of Nerval, but I can use Ferajit's effect to put back this Apex Avian. Because I'm going to summon that from the Simorg uh, anyway. And the Fractal's a really nice draw. We don't even need it. Like, I'm not even going to use it here. Because um, we've already, you know, done all of our setup. But, yeah, you know, like I said, we get to run out the Ancient Warrior's Oath Double Dragon Lords. Uh, now we're going to use the Barrel Canary effect here to special summon the Sapphire Swallow. And that'll let us get our Ensemble Robin. Which I actually definitely should have put over here. Um, well, actually, no, because I'm going to put the, the Apex Avian. What I really should have done was put the F-Zero over here. Uh, that way I could have had both the Ensemble Robin and the Apex Avian protected by the Simorg uh, target protection effect there. But Alright, so yep, Apex Avian comes down during the end phase. And um, this, these four here are pretty typical end board. Turn one for Tri, or, yeah, tri Brigade Leerlusk, or Bird Up as we're playing. Uh, the Kit and Double Dragon Oath was because I had that extra Tri Brigade monster in hand, which was nice, but... Uh, this isn't necessarily a part of the standard turn one end board, but Simorg, Apex Avian, Draco Future, and Ensemble Robin, that is a very typical end board for turn one for this deck. 
And on top of that, we've also got a, a bunch of really good monsters going into turn two uh, to make some plays there. But it's going to start off by special summoning a Shathana. I'm just going to go ahead and bounce that back to the hand, uh, so that way they can't go into a Monk of the Tenyi. Uh, with that Monk on board, that enables like so many plays from the, the Tenyi side of that deck, so I'm definitely just going to get that out of there. Plus, the Unsal Blue Robin on this end board is most likely to get targeted because of the fact that I didn't put it under the Simorg, and also it's low attack points, so I definitely want to use the Ensemble Robin effects while I can, especially, especially because also you get to use multiple Ensemble Robin activations per turn, so definitely going to utilize that while I can. I'm not really sure why the opponent bothered throwing out a called by here. Oh, it was for the Droplet, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so the opponent is going to break our board here with Droplet, uh, utilizing the upstart and the call by, and then yeah, sending the other two cards from hand to graveyard, which looks like their deck or their hand wasn't super great. They also sent an upstart and a Shathana. I think I might have activated that other upstart first though, right? Would you think you'd wanna? Hmm. They did manage to get an emergence for Ataya, so they'll have some kind of action here. Um, oh my god, I forgot. This was Mathmex Sword Soul. That's right. Because they yeah, they do this out of left field. They they throw out the Taya for assignment mining. And then start going into Math Mech plays. I can't believe I glossed over that when I was looking at the deck here. But yeah, this is actually Math Mech Sword Soul, if you can believe it. So this is definitely not ideal, <laughs> obviously. Uh, the opponent's going to get to set up that Super Factorial. And again, because of Droplet, there's not really anything I can do about it. But at the same time, I'm really not concerned at all. <laughs> because I know the opponent's not going to be able to win the duel on this turn. And like... Yeah, that Super Factorial is going to be annoying, but, like, I've already got my whole board established. Like, the Super Factorial is pretty good for for breaking setups, but as far as breaking already established boards, it can only send one card that's on the field to the graveyard. So here, yeah, the opponent's just going to go for an update Jammer Axis code, but they can't OTK me. I have too many monsters on the field. Like, they just don't have enough Link monsters to banish. Like... Even if they had gone for a Transcode Talker as well, which they could have if it's in their extra deck, they might not have had room for it because they're playing Sword Soul stuff as well for some reason. Um, it's, I mean, it's not like the worst combination of cards, I guess? I, I don't know. Um, but, yeah. Um, yeah. Even if they had gone for the Transcode and gotten another Link Monster in Graveyard and Earth one. Like, yeah, it, it still would have had stuff on board. They were not able to punch through for lethal. So, yeah, the opponent is going to have a Super Factorial live with the Diameter, but again, I've got so much gas in my hand here. I'm just, I'm not worried at all. Especially because I also have two very relevant on, uh, effects on board that I get to start with. Right off the bat, I'm just going to use Kit's effect for four and get a Shurig, and... My opponent is going to flip up Super Factorial in response to the Shura getting summoned, but this is too late. This is actually too late, and it's not going to do anything as a result, so I'm going to show you why, too. So the opponent's going to flip up Super Factorial. Um, here, I'll just use... whatever. I'll use Double Dragon Lords now, just because I've already used the kit. I don't need it anymore. Get that Axis Code off the field. Then they'll go for Laplacian, but... Here's the thing about Laplacian, and it's not even just about Laplacian, this is just about how uh, resolution of effects works as a whole. So, um, in Yu-Gi-Oh, chain links cannot be interrupted. Uh, for that reason, my opponent did not have a chance to activate Laplacian's effect with Shurig still on the, on the chain link. I almost said the stack, we're not playing magic here. Similarly, they couldn't use the diameter effect yet because we still had to resolve the current chain link. Part of resolving the current chain link was resolving Shurig as chain link one. So when I used Shurig to banish Laplacian, my opponent did not have any opportunity to activate an effect to negate it, because again, you can't disrupt chain links, nor did they get an opportunity to activate the send one monster, you know, card in your opponent's hand, etc. etc. They didn't get to use this effect because Laplacian was no longer on the field at the time the chain link had resolved. So that's something very, very important to remember, especially if you're playing Math Mech, or if you're playing Tri Brigade with Revolt. Uh, this is also something that you really need to keep in mind, is that um, your monster's effects from the trap card you activated will not start resolving until the current chain link has resolved. Also, 
if a card is removed before the resolution of a chain link, before it had a chance to activate its optional effects, those optional effects do not get a chance to activate, so. And then, yeah, we're just going to see a conceit from my opponent right after that. So, wanted to show that game for multiple reasons. It's a decent showing of what this deck can do on turn one. And then also, uh, just wanted to, once again, hammer that point home with a little location at the end there. Uh, gotta make sure that you're activating that preemptively. If my opponent, um, if they wanted to negate the Shurg that was going to come out, what they should have done was used or chained a super factorial to the activation of Kit's effect. Then Laplacian would have been on the board, uh, been coming on the board at the same time Shurg was, and could have used its negate effect on Shurg's effect. So there is that duel. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. All righty, this game here is going to be against good old Bird Up. Or not bird up, sorry, jeez. Flanderies. Wow. <laughs> um, with bird up, we're, for, we're having a, a bit of a bird mirror match. Not quite the same birds, but birds nonetheless. So going second against flow is not ideal, but opening Ash and Imperm going second against flow, that's definitely a bit more ideal. But let's go lead with a terraforming. Uh, in the past, I've been a little hesitant to Ash terraforming in certain metas, but in this meta, definitely want to Ash Blossom terraforming whenever you see it. If it's not searching the runic fountain uh then it's going to be trying to search the um the magnificent map also i love that new animation for ash blossom that she laughs at the card she negates <laughs> oh it's great it's so great uh, i can only imagine how people are going to mauled over that but here the opponent's got actually a really really good line um where they're going to use the street to try to basically make their plays live with the uh, Flanderies and um, Advent of Adventure. I always forget what this card is called. Now, one thing that's important to note is that my opponent summoned a street. I did have a chance to negate with Imperm, um, but I opted not to. And the main reason I opted not to wasn't even to play around Advent of Adventure, um, which actually was honestly the main reason to do it, but because, you know, the street doesn't really threaten anything by itself here. Like, even if their last card is Eaglin, uh, then I can just, you know, Imperm the Eaglin instead. But no, here they were clearly searching for the Rabina. And actually, thanks to the way they built that chain link, they get to then normal summon the Rabina off of the Stree's effect. This is actually a very good line that my Flandre's opponent is doing here, but unfortunately for them, uh, I opened Imperm, so. I will say that Flandre's is probably one of the biggest reasons you would still want to play Valor and Imperm, uh, if you do still choose to play. Valor and Imperm. Although, now that I think about it, to be fair, those don't even always stop the deck. Like, if they have Magnificent Map, then Valor and Imperm is, is often not enough to do it by itself. So, I don't know. Like I said, I'm, just, I'm not super feeling those cards this format. Alright, so here I'm going to lead with Fractal for literally this exact reason. I wanted to bait out an Ash Blossom to see if my opponent had it. And they actually did. If this Fractal had resolved, I probably just would have gone Kit and then Nerval and then added a Keros for potential um, extenders if I needed it. Uh, but here, like I said, my main main thing I was trying to do was just bait out the Ash, and we actually managed to do that. So that's very, very nice. Now, I know their last... Actually, do I know their last card? I'm trying to remember if I do. And <laughs> there's another little laugh there. Um, I'm trying to remember if I actually know what their last card is. I don't think I do now that I think about it. Yeah, I don't know what their last card is, but... It's not super likely to be relevant. Um, you know, Flanderies, they don't play like Maxi and Nibiru, so. If we play through an Ash Blossom, I'm not really anticipating anything else out of their hand. All right, so we're seeing a pretty similar setup to the last duel. This time, though, I'm summoning the Nerval with the Swallowtail, and then special summoning the Ferrajit. So, similar order, or similar um, method, rather, just a slightly different order. Now you get to add a Tri Brigade monster off of the Nerval's effect. I'm just going to get another Fractal here. Going to go for the Utopic Draco Future before making more plays. On the off chance they somehow have a relevant card effect in hand, but I can't imagine they do. And then now I get to use Ferrigy to special summon the Fractal, and then from there I can, yeah, I can banish three for uh, the Race Vulgar or some more, but it would have to be Race Vulgar because some more can't be used as a material. And then we make access code Tucker and just OTK as our opponent realized before they conceded there. So another fairly standard game of how this deck typically likes to play this time. 
we got to go second and opened well enough to control down our flow opponent. So there's that duel. Let's go and take a look at the next one now. Got another game against Sword Sultani here. This one's this one's a little all over the place though. It's playing like Gold Sark and Triple Blackout. Triple Blackout. I mean, I think that's better in Sword Soul than Cosmic Cyclone, to be fair, but uh, anyway, I get to go first here. Um, opening Fractal plus Bird Call is pretty interesting. Uh, I actually misplayed here. Um, as you can see, I once again, I went on autopilot and I pitched Fractal, and I was like, oh, I'm pitching Fractal, so now I'll pitch Kit, and I was like, no, wait, I actually should have, I should have pitched the Cobalt Sparrow there, um, and then... Um, yeah, and then I could have used Bird Call to add Warbler to my hand, and then specialed it, and then specialed the Sparrow out of my graveyard. But we actually can salvage this, uh, and how I'm going to do that is I'm going to use that Keros that I added, not special summoning it, but just normal it, because I'm going to special summon the Cobalt Sparrow off of the Ferrajit that I get off of Keros, and that's going to be how I activate this monster's effect. I also didn't want to discard the Apex Avian, uh, because I'm still planning on ending on Simorg, even though I made this slight misplay, we're still able to do this here. And so we're going to use Ferrajit to get that uh, Cobalt Sparrow, and then I'm just going to link the Ferrajit and the Sparrow together in order to make that Simorg. And then using these uh, Sparrows, you add a Barrel Canary. So, that's yeah, not like super ideal, like we're going to unfortunately miss out on some of our end board that we could have made, but, um, you know, one of the things that I really like to, to talk about that I haven't talked about relatively recently is, um, you know, not being too hard on yourself for misplaying and just trying to make the best of the scenario. Like, yeah, this board isn't ideal. We should have a Utopic Draco future as well. Um, and I think there are a lot of people who would, like, concede here, who would just, like, concede out of frustration or out of, like, embarrassment. But, um, you know, when it comes to competitive play, this is very, very relevant for uh, tournament play, but I think it's relevant for ladder as well. If you want to ladder up in a time efficient manner, you might think like, oh, I screwed up or, oh, I didn't open optimally. I'll just lose and go to the next game to get to it more quickly. That's more time efficient. It's actually not though, because by losing, you're taking a huge time hit because that's now another game you're going to have to play to catch back up to where you were before. So. I think sticking through the game you're in and trying to play it out is, again, not just better for um, getting a more competitive and tournament-focused mindset if you're interested in that, but even if you're not, it's still more time efficient most of the time, not every time, but most of the time, than like conceding when you have a quote-unquote mediocre setup like this, so. Yeah, the opponent's going to tie in and run over my Ensemble Robin here. Um, obviously, I would have just bounced the token they special summoned otherwise. Um, but it's also going to use up their battle phase to do that. And actually, now that I look, they didn't even really have anything they could use with Taya here. Um, they do set a bunch of back rows. Now that we know after the fact that the opponent's got three Blackout, uh, it's pretty likely Blackout's one of them. This Ash Blossom on the Simorg effect isn't, like, terrible. Well, I mean, it, <laughs> it wouldn't have been terrible if it had resolved if my opponent hadn't, uh, or if somebody hadn't called by an Ash Blossom there. I'm actually trying to remember why that fizzled. Hang on, because my opponent successfully resolved Ash Blossom on my turn, right? Yeah, they did it on the... Uh, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, that was last game. They Ashed the Fractal there. Yeah, yeah, so they, they called by... Oh, I, I they called by my Ash Blossom on their turn. That's what it was. So even if the Ash Blossom had resolved on some more, like, that doesn't mean anything. Like, I have... You can kind of see I have Barrel Canary and Fractal and Bird Call in my hand. So, like, I... I was spoiled for options there. Uh, was not wanting for options at all. We do have one more game to take a look at. Let's jump straight into it here. And our final duel for this video is going to be up against Branded Despia. Good old Branded Despia. I think this build was playing like 47 cards or something stupid like that. Hang on, let me see here. Yeah, they're playing 47 cards. It's so funny with, uh, with Branded Despia, the fact that you can just get away with playing like however many cards you want. I like to stick to 40 still, but for consistency's sake, but that's just me. I mean, look at the look at the MCS week one, you know, the second place deck was a branded SPA deck that was 46 cards, so. Um, yeah, here I'm gonna start off with the Tenki. Uh, gonna use that to um, mostly check for Ash Blossom, but here actually, 
Um, it can kind of matter. I don't know. I actually kind of thought about just sending the Sparrow here again, but then I realized um, I actually had a line where I could get the uh, Sim Morg, and even though it's going to look a little bit weird, um, and it's not going to involve like Turquoise Warbler or anything, we're still able to end on a pretty standard end board with a kind of wonky opening hand here. The nice thing about this opening hand in particular is that um, this is one of the rare times where we get to summon the Simorg before we summon either of the Recital Starlings. So we get to double buff our Simorg up to 3600 attack points, which is super duper relevant. We also get to add DD Crow here because uh, we've already used Barrel Canary and we don't need any of the other extenders. So. We actually had two extra adds because of that, so with the second one, I'll add another Barrel Canary for the next turn in case I need it. Yeah, if you've got an extra search after the DD Crow, I like getting a Barrel Canary for the next turn. Not just for comboing, but even if things go like completely south, you can use the Barrel Canary to potentially go into Assembled Nightingale and then up to Zeus from there. So this board isn't gonna is gonna end rather without the Ensemble Blue Robin this time, but. That's definitely better, um, or it's definitely better to end without that than without the Draco Future. Excuse me. Yeah, so since I know they're branded Despia, I'm just gonna let this this uh, tragedy resolve here. Foolish, I actually typically do not use Ash Blossom on this, um, because in my experience, most of the time, not every time, but most of the time, whatever they're foolishing is gonna be some kind of effect that Ash can stop anyway. Whether it's Despian Tragedy, whether it's Block Dragon. Um, I'm trying to think of the other main cards that get Foolish in this meta. There's not a whole lot else right now, honestly, but um, Foolish, they'll typically have something later down the line worth negating. Here, I'm absolutely holding my Ash Blossom until I see a Branded Fusion, which the opponent is very clearly, desperately trying to bait out, but I am not falling for it. And then they just concede. I forgot they just straight up conceded after that. Um, but. Yeah, that's definitely something that's worth noting, um, is recognizing when your opponent's trying to bait something. Uh, Branded Despia is one of the easiest decks to recognize baits. Um, pretty much if you see Allure of Darkness or Fright for Patchwork, um, any amount of searching effects before the Branded Fusion, they're probably trying to bait out your Ash Blossom for a Branded Fusion. So, yeah, there I was pretty just stoic and not taking my opponent's baits uh, and just saving the Ash Blossom. I mean, Ash Blossom aside, that ignores the fact that we still had Apex Avian and Draco Future and Maxi and DD Crow and Barrel Canary for the next turn. So, yeah, that's the strength of Bird up there, the ability to play uh, so through so many different kinds of hands and then have a fairly tenacious end board there. So that's going to do it for these games. Let's go ahead and look now to our outro. All right, everybody, thank you so much for watching all the way to the very end of the video like this. That means a whole lot to me, uh, not just personally, but it's also a great way of supporting the channel as well. If you're interested in supporting the channel in other means, uh, you can, of course, feel free to comment and or subscribe right here on YouTube. Uh, I'm always looking to the comments section. Uh, you guys leave some pretty awesome feedback uh, as far as like constructive criticism goes when it comes to deck building, gameplay, channel content, all that stuff. So feel free to leave your opinion down there. I will be sure to take a look at that there. Uh, and then subscribing is going to be the best way to get notifications of when these videos drop. That does happen every day, by the way. So if you're looking for daily Master Duel content, you've come to the right place. And there are more places where you can get some daily Master Duel content. If you check out the description below, follow the top link over to my Patreon page. Uh, there for just five bucks a month, which is as much as you pay for a booster pack uh, You'll find a lot more value than a pack full of filler over there. We've got some Previews for content upcoming here on the channel. We've got some exclusive games uh, that are only posted over on patreon over there We've got some Q&A's and then you can also have your name featured in this lovely credit sequence where um, I thank all of the people who are uh, helping contribute over there on Patreon. Uh, it's a huge support to the channel, and it really means a lot as well. So thank you everyone who is donating uh, that is featured here on screen. And again, um, you know, it's not just a pure donation. You do get some more daily Master Duel content over there just for being a part of the Patreon. But I think that's about all the time that I have for today's video. Once again, I just want to thank you so, so very much for sticking all the way to the end of the video. Again, it just means a lot as I do um, put a decent amount of work into getting these videos out every single day. But 
that's about all the time that I've got for now. So without further ado, this is Xlex. I'm signing out, and I hope you have a fantastic day.